Hey, Ryan, thank you so much for coming on the show, my man. I'm really excited to have this chat. I have been seeing you nonstop on socials and, and the growth of your brand, and I thought you would be a perfect fit for the audience that we have. So I appreciate you carving out the time and your busy day to come on here and chat with us. Thanks, man. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, for sure. Um, I know I like to get right into things, let people know just a little bit about you. Who is Ryan Bartlett and what has your experience been? And then from that, we'll start really diving into things. I mean, who I am now is much different than who I was <laughs> earlier in life. But I would say now I'm a father, I'm a husband, um, I'm a good friend to a lot of people, I'm a business owner, and uh, you know, I'm just trying to do the best that I can. But I think ultimately I'm I'm a creative, I'm a marketer, um, I'm a guy who loves philanthropy. I love helping people in timely situations. I am, you know, I'm just, I'm just someone who's trying to do right by humans ultimately, put out an amazing product that they really value, and then utilize my resources for good for the world is, is kind of really who I am at the crux. I mean, that's amazing. And, and doing my research, doing my homework on you, I, I really got that sense from you. You do a lot of philanthropy work. A lot of what you do is treating people the right way and, and, and really making sure that you're a stand-up person, um, and and it shows. And I know you've been doing amazing charity work, and I have some questions here down the line that really dive in. But True Classics is what we're here to talk about. It's this amazing brand. You've had an amazing journey. You put in those 10,000 hours. You wanted to be a music producer. You jumped into the music industry. You wanted to be in the nightclub scene. You jumped into the nightclub scene. You wanted to get in the online world. Then you jumped into the SEO world, and now we're here. So you've had all of these amazing journeys. but Let's start with True Classics. You spent $3,000 on your first round of inventory and made 20K in month one. How did that feel? It was a surprise. I don't think we really realized what we had been sitting on. Um, I mean, I would have started it way sooner had I known that there was just <laughs> like money waiting to be made. Um, so yeah, it was a little bit surreal. We, I don't, the three of us never, 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 never thought it was going to go that quickly, that fast, and and really force us to quit everything else that we were doing. We had a ton of other initiatives that we wanted to launch too. I wanted to get into the um, matcha business. I wanted to do um, the lab grown diamond business. I thought was like a really hot business at the time that was giving a lot of value back to people in a in a market where they were overcharging. Um, yeah, I mean, we had so many things we wanted to do, but this thing just really resonated with people very early on. And we were, uh, we were really happy that people loved the product and, and, you know, we knew we were really onto something in that first month and it just, it was just a game changer for all of us. Yeah. And, and it's awesome that you wanted to do all of those cool things. And I, and I love hearing people who are, have the aspirations to launch a bunch of brands. Do you feel like you were comfortable doing that because of your extensive background in a lot of other fields? Because I know sometimes people are like, I, I can't even get up to start one thing. You wanted to start multiple exactly. things and, and one of them ended up being a home run. Would you attest a lot of that to your background? It is part of that. I think any entrepreneur realizes that at the, at the core of what you do, it's just providing value to another human on the other side. So whether it was matcha or diamonds or whatever it was, I was going to go way deep on the customer and just like absolutely kill everyone else around me in the marketplace. And so it just so happens that um, the clothing thing was just a very organic problem that I had been thinking about for some time. And then the more I dug into it, the more I just realized that like everyone's just underdoing it and overcharging. And it just felt like the right market to go into, even though everyone told me I was insane for trying to sell plain clothing, like, like as if it hasn't been done. But what I keep telling everybody is that every business has room to improve. It doesn't matter what you do or what you sell. Everything can always be improved because that improvement is ultimately on just going deeper and being more intentional for the customer. So I really wasn't scared in any of these businesses because I just knew there's always a way to go above and beyond and just work a little bit harder than the next guy and take market share from them. Especially when you look at like what these big companies are going through, which is, you know, down into the right, 
you know, they've just completely lost the connection with the customer and they're just not giving the customer what they need anymore. It used to be easy. It used to just be, hey, here I am, big brand, come buy me because I'm here and alive. And people would go, hey, that's the guy that does that. I'm going to go buy him because he's alive. Now people are like, no, no, no. It's not enough to be alive. Now you need to give me marketing that satisfies what I want to know about you. You need to, you need to really solve a problem for me. You need to uh, be involved in some kind of philanthropy on some level because I need to know that some of your dollars are being allocated towards doing right by humans. So people just, they're tired of the legacy brands just kind of getting away with doing the bare minimum. And they've been doing it for a very long time. And what you're seeing is this shift where we're able to take market share from all the big brands because they just see us and they go, oh, well, see, that company's thinking about, that company's actually thinking about what I need versus the rest of them that are just putting out whatever, however, whenever, and charging what they want. You know, we're being super methodical with keeping our life, our prices as low as they possibly can be for the customer, which is good for them, and making the quality as high as it possibly can be uh, for the customer, which is obviously good for them. So, it, you know, we're just, we're living in a weird place where brands are starting to shift and change because they're starting to see what happens when you don't listen to the market and when you're not going as deep as these other brands. And by the way, this will happen in every single business you see with the ones that are breaking through the more you peel back those layers the more you realize they just went deeper and by the way that goes for like all the SaaS vendors that we have internally that we work with the ones we end up going with are the ones that are innovating and they're thinking about the customer and they're giving us profitability metrics and they're like they're really going that extra mile and then we're looking back at the legacy brands and we're like dude what are these guys doing <laughs> They're all just sleeping and thinking that they can add a feature here, add a feature there, and we're somehow just going to stay around forever. But what they're realizing is there's always somebody on your heels that's going to outwork you and make things better, make things more innovative, and people are going to naturally gravitate towards that. So it happens in every market. So to go back to your question, um, you know, I, I had a lot of angles in each of those businesses that I wanted to take, but out of all of them, Clothing was definitely my most passionate and it was the one I wanted to work the most. And so we didn't have that many weeks of like starting a million businesses in mind because True Classic started to take off that fast. So it wasn't like we were sitting around for six months. Yeah. This was like in the first month that we opened. We like hit my whiteboard and we listed all these things we wanted to do. And within like two weeks, we were like, mm, just cross off the whole list. Like I just really want to put my energy into True Classic because I think there's something here. And that's really what we did. Yeah, and I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think the customers are are demanding more, and and they rightfully so are demanding more because a lot of these legacy brands had very little competition during their big prime time, and they didn't need to do that much. And I, I work at a huge company in tech, so I get it. When they get too big, they get very lethargic, mm -hmm. and you start to lose that personal touch. And I love that there's so much opportunity for entrepreneurs to go in and innovate in these already, what you would say, saturated spaces. But if you can go be that much better and capture 2% of that market and then treat those customers 20 times better than what the legacy brand will, you will build a very loyal following and a very strong brand, which I think this is a perfect example of. And again, we, we talk about treating the customer and how important that is. I have it written down here to ask you in other interviews, you talk about really knowing your customer, treating them right. How much has that affected true classics and their success? I think just going above and beyond for humans in general is the way to look at it. I think you could definitely drill down and say our demo is, you know, 25 to 55 and, and mostly men for the, you know, but like the way I think about it is a lot more broadly. I just really think about like what affects everybody, not really a specific demo. Um, and by the way, just really quick to put a button on what we were talking about earlier, you don't even have to create something totally innovative compared to the next guy. You can, even if you just create, let's just uh, take like a random, like a Levi's. If you just create another Levi's and just treat everyone better, but you're going to build a massive business, right? Like that's yep. what I'm saying. People think that you have to like somehow reinvent the wheel, but it's like, no, 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 just build what the big buildings have done and then treat everyone way better 
give them more and just watch how different people treat you compared to the other businesses. So, um, but to answer your question, yeah, I mean, listen, it just comes down. A lot of it is like gut instinct and what I think people really want out of a product or what they want out of a price or an ad or a retail experience. A lot of it is just like a having a good grasp on what humans want out of life and how to make their life easier. We all know that humans want everything to be easier. That's a yep. big one for us. And that's why when you see the website, that's why everything's in groups because guys don't shop in singles. They shop in groups. They shop in packs. They want, they want the best discount and that means a bigger pack, but they also just want you to like curate the collection for them, which is like saves the, the customer time. And then so, and now we're even doing that in retail, which is a weird thing. Cause if you go into any retail store, have you ever seen when you walked into a retail experience and it, everything's in packs, like I've never no. seen it in my life. Right. Yeah, and no. why is that? That's because none of those legacy brands are thinking about the customer. They're not thinking that, oh, it's actually better for the customer if I bulk put it into a pack because then they're going to save more when they, when they you know, spend more. And it's also better for the business. It raises AOV, but also it saves the customer time. Like they don't want to be in there shopping and pairing and like do that. They just want to go, oh, it's that color, those three. Great. Grab it. Go. I'm out of here. Right. You're saving them time. So like whatever you can build to save people time, ultimately, it could be shirts, could be SaaS, it could be any kind of product. People value that more than anything. So I, I tend to look a lot about what we do from that perspective is like even, dude, I even go like on subject lines, sometimes on our emails, I'll, I'll see a subject line and I'll just be like, why are you guys trying to force them to click into the email? Like there, a lot of our, like we get really playful in some of our subject line, we get really creative and we're trying to, you know, get them to you know, like the open rate, the open rate needs to be higher. So we're going to say something kind of ambiguous in the subject line that'll get them to open. And I'm like, guys, stop, like stop. I know what you're trying to do and I appreciate the growth hackiness of it, but like, they don't care. Like just let, tell them in the title what's happening. Like just tell them in the subject so they can just scroll through their email because there's a million emails and just tell them what the, what the deal is with the email. Stop trying to like hack it, you know? And, and, and now I get it because that's part of their world, right? Like they're trying yep. to increase numbers and stats. And I love that and for, for that. But like, I'm always like, guys, like we just have to go back to the basics and just tell the customer what is in this email. Let's not get overly tricky. So I'm just living in like, how do I save time for customers pretty much 24 seven on the website, in retail, in emails. I mean, you name it. It's just like, how can we give them the most, the quickest and, and make their life better in some way, shape or form other than like just having an amazing product. So, yeah, no. And, and, I, and I think that's great. And you can tell that you really care about that. Like I see you on socials. I see you communicating with your customers, always asking for feedback, always trying to get better. And I think that's like the coolest thing from a CEO's perspective. And I had a really similar experience with the president of Shopify, Harley. Yeah, I love um, Harley. He's a good friend yeah. of ours. He's a, I, I don't know him personally at all. I have a friend who has a cigar brand that's taking off. He's had a serious problem with payment processors. He's on Shopify. So I said, you know what? I see Harley responding to people all the time. I, I, shot a, I shot a message out. I said, Harley, I have a great friend who loves your product, but can't get a processor to work. He saw it, DM'd me, emailed me, put me in contact with someone at Shopify, and we had a payment processor set up for my friend in two weeks. I went and bought Shopify shares immediately after that interaction because exactly right. that level of personal experience is so uncommon in these large companies in this industry. And I think that you just keep highlighting such a perfect example where you don't need to innovate. All you need to do is treat the customer better. We've gotten so used to these legacy brands mistreating us and not giving us the attention we as a customer deserve because at the end of the day, we're shopping and we're putting money in their pockets. And now we've had amazing brands like yours pop up on the scene and show a customer what a real good experience looks like. And I can't see why people wouldn't shop other in other areas. And you're I actually, I knew about true classic through you. I've never bought a shirt. But as I started to tell people, hey, I'm, I'm having the true classic CEO on 
almost every single guy that I talked to was like, no way. That's crazy. Like I have three shirts. I have three shirts. Like I follow Ryan online and I'm like, that. man, like what, what an awesome brand to carry behind you. And I think that's just, I mean, I'm, I'm doing a little fangirl here, but like, that's so amazing to me because I'm super passionate about the customer. I'm super passionate about having a good experience because at the end of the day, we're giving our time to these brands. Like if I go on the true classic website, if I spent 30 minutes on there, I gave you 30 minutes of my time. Your goal is to make my experience shorter, better, and quicker. Where a lot of these other websites, I feel like they're gaming me into shopping and sitting on there for a while and all these growth hacks. So I, I think you're doing it right. And I think that's a great segue into the next question is you really started drilling down on the customer. You went from the 20K in month one to 100 million in your first two years. Where did that growth really come from? And what were the challenges that you faced from that growth? My God, uh, how long do we have <laughs> on, the, on the challenges? I mean, to go just to like go back to what you were saying, I couldn't agree with you more about Harley. The guy is a boots on the ground operator like we are. And, and that's why he wins, right? Like it's not a big mystery. When we had an issue internally with coupon codes, this is before I knew Harley personally. I just went to Twitter. I tagged Toby. And within seven minutes, Toby had tagged their CTO and he had fixed our coupon issue by the end of the day. That's what, that's what we're talking about, right? Like just exactly what you said. I had the exact same experience. And so more businesses over time are going to start noticing this and seeing the outliers and what it takes to really move the needle. And it will eventually replicate. And all these big brands are finished. It's over for them finished. because, 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 because we're all coming in. We're like, Hey, we're here to help. And everyone else is like, Hey, we're just up here in corporate world trying to make sure we have a good Q4 and hit our numbers and get our bonuses. And, and we're just like, we just want to do right by people. And that's why people gravitate to brands like that. Um, but to answer your next question about, um, the problems. I mean, good Lord, man, everything was a problem in the beginning. We didn't know what we were doing. I mean, I knew, uh, I knew how I wanted to take care of the customer. I knew how I wanted the product to fit. I knew, I knew what to do marketing wise. I knew we were living in a Facebook marketing world, which we still are. Um, but what I couldn't have foreseen are the issues you run into with three PLs. Um, some of the three PLs we used early on are now bankrupt, which doesn't surprise me. So we went through nightmares. And for anybody listening, can you, sorry, for anybody listening, can you explain a 3PL um, for like yeah. a business owner listening? So basically you have to hire, so you have to distribute your goods, right? You can either mm -hmm. do it at your house or you can hire someone to basically do it for you at a 3PL. And so you get into these contracts with them. They have SLAs, like SLA is service level agreements. And basically they say, okay, if you get X amount of products, it's going to go out by X amount of time. Right. Like, so let's just say you have a hundred orders. Those hundred orders are going to be fulfilled within two business days or something like that. And so you come up with all these agreements with the 3PL and you have to hold them to it. And you have to watch very carefully, you know, why are my packages not going out? Why are you guys taking too much time? And like, you know, you can tell when like things aren't going well because things go missing, things start taking too long. And um, we started getting into this issue where we were split shipping stuff and it was charging us double when you split ship and all of a sudden our, our shipping costs went through the roof and we were like, what the heck's going on? And they're like, Oh, it's a problem with our software. We'll figure it out. They couldn't figure it out. So here we are paying double all of a sudden overnight on split shipping. And it was driving us nuts because we're just watching every order come in, getting split shipped. And we're like, this is insane. And by the way, all your inventory is there. So what are you going to do? You just gonna yep. pull it out and drive it across. Like it's, it takes real time and energy to, to move inventory. So that was like probably one of the first biggest nightmares we had was figuring out uh, which 3PL we could trust. That was tough. Um, and in the beginning, we didn't have a lot of credibility. We didn't have anyone that would really vouch for us. So we just had to kind of like find who we could afford, which is not the way to find one. It's just yeah. like we were doing what we could. We were bootstrapped. So we weren't trying to... Um, you know, invest a lot early on. But what we ended up finding was a, a 3PL that crushed it for us. And they do a lot of the big brands. And that gave us a lot of confidence. We're like, all right, if they're working for, you know, Bombas and MeUndies and all these other big D2C brands, they got to be doing right by them. And that's yeah. what happened. And here we are literally three years later, still with them. 
And um, it's been amazing. Not to say we haven't had uh, little hiccups along the way, but all of them do. There's no way around it. There's so many ways for things to go wrong at 3PLs, whether it's um, the SLAs not being met, inventory not being found, uh, things sitting in storage when they shouldn't, um, things just getting uh, mispicked. Like there's like a certain allowance of mispicks that they have like built into the contracts. And um, so I would say that's a big one. Um, I would say hiring is really, really difficult. I know that's a challenge that everybody runs into. I fundamentally think that the hiring process is completely flawed. I actually would love to just like get around a group with every CEO in the world and go, Hey guys, we're rethinking how hiring works. Okay. Let's all be on the same page about this. And then we all just follow suit. My idea is let's give everyone trials, right? Let's give everyone a trial basis, see how it goes over a certain period of time, 30 days, 90 days, whatever we decide. And then if it doesn't work out, no harm, no foul. We all go back to what we were doing. And you know, that way we can get someone in and see how it works because Interviews are so insanely flawed. You sit there, mm -hmm. you talk to someone, they tell you the world, they tell you the, how great they are, and then you're just like, great, that's exactly what I'm looking for. What do you know? You're <laughs> telling me what I want to hear. Shocker. And so I just think that it's just not, and we get people in, and then like it, we very quickly you realize that like it's just not going to work. Like they're just, they, they're looking like a deer in headlights every time you ask them a question. Um, it's just, you know, there's obviously a little bit of, uh, you know, they have to, grow into a role sometimes. And sometimes it's, it's a lot more difficult, like a finance role. They got to learn a lot about the business or like a BI data role. I mean, dude, those guys could spend months before they come out with a dashboard, right? They have to get their hands around the data as they like to say. Um, but you know, I think just hiring is so difficult and it's a, such a flawed process that I really want to reimagine it. Now it's tough because you can't really expect people to quit a job and just like trial and error it for 30 to 90 days. That's the hard part that we need to figure out. But um, I just think there's a better way. And I, and I want to figure it out because I think it would do right by both the business and the person getting hired because you don't want to get them in and then have to like um, send them back out into the world with nothing. Like you really want to like basically segue them into another role with someone you know. That's, that's genuinely what we do uh, when something doesn't work out. We're like, well, who do we know that they would be a good fit for? And then we just kind of like, because we're such a rocket ship, you either sink or swim here. You either like hit the ground yeah. running and start making a dent or you're just lost and you don't know what to do and you're nervous. And um, even with like all the feedback in the world from uh, your managers, if it's not sinking in the first couple of weeks, something's got to give. Um, yeah. so those are two big challenges. Um, I mean, there's a lot of other ones I could go deeper, but yeah. um, I'm sure you got well, more here, questions. Maybe, yeah. Maybe this is an easier because I mean, something I want to highlight here is the scale. I mean, this is a drastic num like a, this is a real hockey stick here. Yeah. And I, I don't even know if we can call it a hockey stick cause you really didn't have time that wasn't going straight up. So it's just a straight line up <laughs> here. And I know that it's always daunting. Everybody's like, watch out when you scale. That's where businesses go to die, the logistical. So maybe a, a, a quick, simple answer to a CEO listening or somebody in the product space that's launching. What should they, other than what you mentioned, what should they be weary of as they scale? And what are things that they need to be hyper-focused on to ensure that they are not falling behind or getting caught up in that scale and not be yeah. able to maintain and die? So a couple things, I think number one, and these are really obvious things on the surface, but they become very difficult as the business grows. Number one, demand planning is by far and away still the hardest part of this job. It is accurately forecasting, knowing what each month is going to look like unit wise. Um, it's such a difficult business in that respect. I'm really jealous of SaaS businesses because I'm looking at them <laughs> and I'm just like, you guys got to be kidding me. You have no idea how lucky you are to not yeah. deal with inventory. But um, that is the biggest challenge, uh, especially early on, because you know, even when we were like two years in, we were making massive mistakes on buys. I mean, just way over ordering because what did we have to go by? We just didn't have the tools and we still to this day do not have the real tools. What we have now are high level thinkers that have been in the business a long time that can look at spreadsheets, look at a lot of data and make educated decisions, which is better than nothing. But yep. there currently is no software that we have been able to find that really solves that problem for us. So I would say that scaling, you can only scale 
as good as you can plan, right? Because if you overbuy and you're not making enough revenue, then you're screwed on the invoices that come in because you're not going to be paying people, right? If you underbuy, then you're selling out and you're, you're selling yourself short. So you're again, not allowed to scale. So that's probably one of the biggest things right off the bat is, um, is figuring that part out. Other than that, the key to scaling is you got to have the right people in place too. You got to be like hiring basically all the time, like keeping just a steady round. Like you can't go, okay, we can take the gas off now. Like you just are always in hiring mode when you're scaling because there's always another role to fill. And even if that role is filled, um, there might be someone who's way better and way more qualified down the line. You don't know. So you got to bring people in and you got to figure it out. Um, I would say that you need your money in order and your credit in order with all these facilities. So as you scale, it gets tight, you know, on money wise, a lot of times. So you have to have sometimes credit facilities come in and help you out. So that could be like a way flyer or like a, like a settle or some of these big credit facilities that basically allow you to um, borrow as much as they think your business can ultimately take on. And then you use that credit just as kind of a revolving line and you just, you know, you pay people and the money comes back and it just like washes in, washes out kind of thing. So that needs to be set up way ahead of time because if you don't have that in place, you're just not, I mean, your credit card bill can only go, I don't know, it's what, 25, 50, 100K if you're lucky. And if you're scaling, that ain't gonna last long, this is not right? Work. Like we tapped out credit cards so early. We were doing that. We had like, mul like, I remember Nick had like multiple Amexes that he was like putting stuff on. And after a while we were like, dude, are we, are we tapped out on credit now? Like we're, we we did not even know what to do <laughs> because we, we had already filled it all up. So what we started to do was we would go to our vendors and we would say, hey, can you give us a credit line? You know, we're running out of credit on our side. Can you get us, I don't know, what's a good term? 45 days, 60 day terms on payable. And then can you also give us, you know, 400,000 in credit? Like just pick a number, right? Like whatever you think that they'll give you. And then as you prove yourself out, it allows you to have leverage to basically go back and renegotiate and say, hey, we've paid you back the 400. You made whatever the interest was on it, you know, if there was any, um, you know, how about you increase it to a million now? Like, are you comfortable with that? And then you just keep that going. And before you know it, like the, the lines get up to like 20, 30 million pretty quickly when you're scaling. So that's inevitably what happened. We started small with some of these manufacturers. We earned their trust and um, they believed in us. So we were able to leverage their credit internally, not have to come out of pocket or go on credit cards or, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's a big game of, um, of credit ultimately. So those are the things I would think about. Also, I, the last most, like if I had to just bucket these into like the top two, three or four, I would say that you cannot scale. Now, if we're talking about like the digital marketing side, like let's say you have all those things already in the bag. You have credit, you have, you have it all figured out on the supply side. Now, the, the, the big crux on the other side is do you have the ability to scale Facebook ads, right? Like let's just say, Everything's good on supply. Now you need to focus on how to get people to the website and convert. So you got to have a couple things in place. You got to have an unbelievable creative team or some agency that's just continually pumping out a load of content. And by the way, the content needs to come at a certain cadence because if you're scaling budgets, the content budget needs to increase with it, right? So if we're yep. doing, let's say, uh, five assets a month at a $1,000 budget, what do you think $100,000 a day looks like? right? Hundreds yeah. and hundreds and hundreds of pieces of content a month. And I mean like high end, not like a, a still image counting as an asset. I'm talking about hundreds of video content that are clipped and reiterated and redone and, and revamped. And I'm talking UGC, I'm talking uh, model shoots, I'm talking comedy skits, you name it. We do absolutely everything because not every customer is the same. Not everything's going to resonate the same. So you got to kind of cover all your bases on the content. And it's much easier said than done. It's yeah. like, yeah, just create good content, right? Like that's so yeah. insanely subjective. Um, so I would say those are the biggest things. If you, if you have all those figured out, you're well on your way. Now that's provided that the product is actually great. Good, right? yeah, great. Now, if you don't have a great product, you're going to have a real tough time. And a lot of these businesses, by the way, that are losing and dying, 
when you look at the product, you're like, it's yeah, great. it's just not great. Like, I know you guys were good at what you were doing and building a business and being creative, but like, is the product that great? Or is it just a lot of hype around a mediocre product? The great products will scale and they will build huge businesses. The ones that are mediocre were meant to be just mediocre businesses. That's just what, how the market responds to mediocre, right? It's just okay. Yep. So you're only going to get yep. partly market share. So, Thank you all for listening to this podcast. Just wanted to take a quick second to give a shout out to Micromedia. Micromedia is the company that I use to essentially create this podcast that you all are consuming right now. They handle my long form editing and my short form editing. I would be pressed to find anybody that's doing better short form than we are here at virtual ventures and micromedia is the company that's making that happen so feel free to reach out to me i can put you in contact with them if that's something you're interested in um and enjoy the rest of the show yeah and i mean uh, two points just to agree with you on there i fully agree hiring is extremely important and then budgeting and the finance portion is crazy important and i know you've mentioned it before your first hire was an accountant and it's, it's important, like you need those individuals who can go in and crunch the numbers and make sure the ship is actually sailing with no leaks and that it's going to be a smooth ride. And then two, with, with the quality of the product, I use my friend Cigar Brand again because that's the closest product I've been to that's been built from the ground up. And I think that industry is a perfect example. He went very home run-ish. He went, there was going to be a strikeout or a home run. He went to a very boring and plain industry with a lot of older clientele and went super loud, super poppy, and and the message was received great. Stores wanted it, but then it was it came time to like, okay, people will buy the product initially because it's so different than the rest. But do you have a quality product that is going to make people reorder? And he did, and he made a very quality cigar, found a very quality um, farm in Nicaragua and started producing. and. It's just, it doesn't stop now. It just continues to grow and he's getting these repeat customers. And I think that's a great example of, yeah, you can have great creative and, and do something different that gets you the initial, but if you don't have a quality product, he would have been not selling cigars at this point. It would have rolled over on its back exactly. after the first initial round of purchases. And I think that's a perfect segue into the content conversation. We were just talking about it, hundreds of pieces of content. You've mentioned that comedy content was like a huge breakout for True Classic. Break that down a little bit for people listening. Yeah, you know, originally I wanted to do it, but I didn't really believe in it just yet. I was skeptical that I could really do it well. And so, you know, I think we went about, mm, about a year with nothing comedy-wise. And I was just kind of like... It just isn't it for me with this like guy standing there looking cool in the park. Like I just, there's, it's gotta be more. Like I'm always thinking that way. So I was kind of like going crazy. Like I just can't sit here and produce the same kind of BS that everyone else does. It drives me nuts. And I'm like, how do I differentiate myself? And I'm like, you know what? Comedy is definitely one of those things that you can differentiate yourself with, but it's so hard, right? Like I, and I didn't know I wasn't a comedy sketch writer. I didn't know what to do. So what I did was I found people that were doing it and I started working with them and I started talking to them and I started building and writing with them. And uh, before I know it, we were coming out with stuff. And dude, when I tell you it was like a light bulb that went off when I would see how these metrics just lit up across the board and I would read the comments and people would just be dying laughing and they just would think it was so great and so funny. And it just inspired me so heavily to do. And because then I also realized, oh, wow, I'm doing right by these people, right? Like I'm not selling anymore. I'm just like making them laugh. And what is a bet? What is more true classic? Then not even advertising, literally just making content to make you laugh, right? That's when it clicked for me. And I was like, oh my God, this is it. This is what we are. We are the brand that figures out how to treat you right in every facet, even in our ads. We're not, we're just gonna, we're just gonna hit you with funny stuff. And if you want to buy stuff, great. If not, great. We don't care. Like at least we made you laugh, right? Like that was my takeaway on it. And it turns out that a lot of times with customers, they just need to be reminded of you. You don't need to necessarily need to sell anything to them. 
They just need to be made aware. And then some down the line, sometime down the line, it's going to be, I don't know, maybe six months, a year, two years. They're going to go, oh, I need t-shirts. And then, oh, I remember that company. They made me laugh. Right. So that's kind of, I was like always playing the long game, even from the beginning. And so I started working with Greg Tube. These guys were phenomenal. We still work with them to this day. I, you know, I help uh, ideate and um, we'll sit there and, and, you know, BS on the phone for 30 minutes to an hour on an idea of what we think is funny, what's not. And then they'll go back to the lab and really flush it out in a formal script. And then they'll produce it and direct it and, and cast it and, and film it and edit it. And they're unbelievable. Um, they're very much an anomaly. I've dealt with a lot of comedians now. I've dealt with a lot of writers. And, um, and these guys are the absolute creme de la creme as far as D to C uh, comedy is concerned. So um, I love it. And it's, it gets more fun because I see more opportunities to work with other uh, comedians in different as uh, aspects of the business. So it's, it's really exciting. I mean, comedy, again, though, is very subjective. And sometimes we'll, we'll write something that we think is great. And then we put it out there and it just literally is the worst. Like, <laughs> I mean, like 0.6 ROAS. Like, I mean, just like we're losing 40 cents on the dollar every time we, we, someone clicks on it. So not everything works. It's a big game of like, you know, let's throw a dart and see if it sticks. Um, but we, we try to do the best we can. I think that's what it comes down to is we're always just thinking about how do we make it informative? How do we make it kind of educational, but always funny so that when they see a true classic ad, they feel good about it and they want to watch it, right? Not like everything else they're seeing where they're just skipping over it and browsing. They're actually going to sit and watch this clip because they want to be entertained. And I just love like playing in that space of like, how do I keep their attention and, uh, and make them feel good about what they're spending time on with us uh, versus everybody else? Yeah, and, and just from a consumer perspective, listening to you talk through these things, it's attractive to me as a consumer to go shop with you knowing that you're not trying to make me buy. You, you, don't, you really, I mean, you would love for me to purchase, but you don't care. If you entertained me and I had a good time and I told somebody, oh, look at this cool ad, or I, I talked about True Classic, it's a win. It's so a win. It's, and, and it's cool because I think at the core, what you started your business on and what your differentiator was even plays into what was the big break in the ads category. Super saturated, millions of people posting ad content all over the place. And what did you say? All right, maybe we do funny stuff. Like what clothing brand is actively putting comedy content out there to get you to buy? Well, that's not, not to get you to buy, but to get their brand in front of you. Yeah, I would say. I would say I personally haven't seen a single one. And then you guys go out and, and, and do this and it's a home run. And I think it just speaks to always being interested in innovating, always try these different things and you never know what's going to hit. And, and I think that was a home run for you. And, and it's cool from a CEO's perspective, something you actually enjoyed and, and was, I guess, somewhat of a passion project for you. Like, hey, I want to do something comedy related with this. How can we do it? executed on it. And now it's like, wow, that was a home run. It wasn't just like a passion project anymore. No, I fed my soul for sure. Like, cause like I said, when I was like, I felt very stagnant when we were just doing the model shoots. I'm just like, this is so lame. Like I get that we need to do this and we still do it, but like, I just don't like to view that. I just, I kept thinking like, what would I want as a consumer? Like if I was looking at a brand, well, I would definitely want to be entertained. Who doesn't want to watch great ads versus yeah. crap ads? And so, again, you go back to thinking about what, what consumers really want and they're tired of the same old stuff. So you got to stand out, man. And comedy is really tough to do. A lot of companies do it, but they do a terrible job of it and yeah. they overproduce it. Like when you look at the Super Bowl ads, you know, everyone's trying to be funny in the Super Bowl yep. ads, right? And you look at the ones that are the best historically, they were simple and they were to the point and they weren't overly produced. But what you have are a bunch of corporations who think they know comedy. So they way overproduce it and they have like six celebrities in the ad. And you're like, guys, it's not about how many celebrities you put in an ad. It's about the fucking idea. It's about the yep. content you're creating for people. Stop just thinking because you throw in Brad Pitt and The Rock, this is going to be the next big thing. It's just so short-sighted and so corporate mentality drives me nuts when I see those ads. I'm just like, wow, 
here they go overpaying massively when all they had to do was find that nuanced Q creative. But one idea that I love that Doritos did was they basically farmed out and said, okay, you come up with the ad customer, right? And they got all these amazing ads from all these small time creators and they use the best one. That to me was genius because then you really are getting the greatest idea because it's not about how well the idea is produced. It's about how great the idea is. That's what people miss. So the, the, the corporates are just thinking, who do we get? Screw the idea. The idea is like third or fourth priority. Who's going to be the face of this? That's corporate America, right? We need yep. Taylor Swift. And <laughs> you're just like, guys, go back to the writing. Just go back to thinking about what people think are funny and current and then build on that and go work backwards from it. So yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting to watch people try to do comedy these days. It's, it's weird. And I think, I mean, I didn't even think about it, but the Super Bowl ad is a perfect example. Like every one of these major brands is trying to make you laugh or entertain you on the TV. And then at the end of every Super Bowl, we go back and pick one or two that actually did mm -hmm. it. And I don't think anybody ever talks about all the failures and wasted money, but it goes back to all of these major corporations have so much money they don't know what to do with that it doesn't matter to them. I don't even think they're trying to have a good ad. I think they more want people to say, oh, did you see Brad Pitt on that Doritos ad? Oh, now you talk about Doritos. So they're they're using their size to to be able to just throw something out there and then yeah. they know it'll be fine. And, and I, I hate that. And I love that they're, I, I, we should have like a Super Bowl for, for small companies where the ads aren't that expensive and you get all these awesome smaller companies just going head to head on quality content. I think so Dude, much more people crush. would enjoy that. Oh would my crush God. It. It's not even crush close. It. They should do like three or four sponsored spots where the Super Bowl allows two or three small companies who obviously couldn't spend Ten yeah. million dollars on thirty seconds, and then see like how that does versus these ones with celebrities left and right. Yeah, unfortunately, the the dollars speak. They don't really care yeah. about great content. They're not in that business, right? No, they're in the business yeah. of who's going to pay the max and who's going to fill this slot. I mean, we're yep. we're going to be on um, for the first time. We're going to be on uh, Thursday night football with Amazon coming up here. Oh, awesome! Uh, not too long, and. Those spots are really expensive, but it's a ton of eyeballs. And so yep. we're going to try it out. We're going to throw some Greg tube ads up there and see how they do. Each game gets like 10 million. Yeah, views. It's, it's wild. It's nuts, but, um, they're filling up quick and you know, it's, it's crazy to see what people are paying for these spots. I was blown away at how expensive it is. I can't even believe it. Like even now I'm looking at the prices and I'm like, <sighs> It's like hundreds of multiple hundreds of thousands for like a 15 to 30 second spot. I mean, Oops. who has that kind of money to just like throw around in, in, you know, it's just, it's a yeah, little it's only mind the blowing. big players. Like it's, it's right. usually just the big players. It, it right. kicks all the little guys out. Um, yeah. Go ahead. If you wanted to so say we, something there. We, we were, we're looking at like the pregame and the postgame spots. Cause those are obviously much more affordable for us. Yeah. And we're a startup. We just, even though we're going to spend North of, I don't know, 80 million this year on ads, those ads are quantified and we, we generate a real clear return on that 80 million versus let me just throw four or 500 K at this little thing. And, see what happens right like that's yeah. the world that they all live in we don't live in that yep. world so it's like no. what am i getting for that exactly and then uh do you have any case studies on what this is going to look like on a return and they're all just kind of like eh, well, uh, well we'll see I, not really but uh you're gonna get x amount of impressions that's what we know it's like great okay guys thank you great it's not just living like in my world at all it's yeah. like a blind dart and hoping it hits the bullseye it's rough but yeah I want to, we, we talked about true classics the whole time, but I want to also highlight you. I mean, you're an extremely successful individual. You've, you've pivoted and, and made some amazing choices and gotten to this point. Like we talked about earlier, you've put in those 10,000 hours in multiple different careers. How much has that impacted your success as a CEO? I couldn't have done this without all that. I, I couldn't have been this creative without putting my 10,000 hours in music, I definitely could not have taken this much risk and bet on myself this big without playing poker for a living and really putting my rent money on the line 
And if I don't make it, then I don't know where I'm going to sleep, probably in my car. Um, and so, you know, when you put yourself in those positions, you really, it forces you to develop and it forces you to learn and it forces you to figure stuff out. And so, and even with the digital marketing, you know, if I hadn't put my 10,000 hours into that business of SEO direct, um, I never would have known that Facebook was the answer early on. I would have been trying everything and I would have been spraying money everywhere like everyone does, by the way. But because I knew that Facebook was the engine that it was and that if you just pumped out great creative that they would find your customer, I funneled every dollar we had into it and I didn't put any money elsewhere. So in terms of just success, I, it goes a bit deeper than just like 30,000 hours between those th you know, three industries. I would say that you know, I was really lucky in the fact that I had great parents that supported me and, um, and sent me on the right path and allowed me to go to school. And um, even though I took on a lot of student debt, um, they put me in a position to win. And um, they encouraged me. They built me up. They made me feel like I could do anything. And man, is that invaluable when you have nothing and you're broke and you have no job and you're trying to find a way. At least... I had the right attitude and you just can't teach that. You know, I remember sitting in Vegas with no money and just thinking like, even though I have no money, my parents are not going to help me anymore. They've exhausted, I've exhausted that trough. My, my sister was like helping me pay my cell phone. Like it was just rough and I had no money, but I, I still remember to this day thinking, I'm going to figure this out no matter what, no matter where I go, no matter what I do, I'm going to find a way out of no way. And, um, you know, you don't get that without really having a great support system of people who believe in you and who will really get behind you on, you know, who you are, what your talents are, how to flush those out. And even though they weren't giving me money, it helped me build a foundation of, of kind of DNA that um, you just got to go out there and make things happen for yourself. That was kind of the advice from my parents when I was just completely broke, which was most of my 20s and early 30s was just like, Listen, you got to get out there and stop feeling sorry for yourself and make something happen. Nothing's going to happen while you're sitting there. And so what did I do after that phone call? I turned around, I emailed a few agencies, and within a two days, I was hired. And it was just like that little bit of initiative and that little bit of willpower and that little bit of confidence that my parents gave me reminded me that I just got to get out there and figure things out. And people will uh, see that I, I'm hungry to work. And then I yep. will, through that, you know, start leveling up and getting better and doing more. And that's exactly what happened when I was in Vegas. It went from, you know, going broke, having nothing to uh, being the hardest working guy at the light group, um, which was, I don't even know if they're still around in Vegas, but they're like a hospitality agency who hires a bunch of promoters and things like that. And so I hit the ground running and I was working circles around everybody because I was so hungry. And man, did they elevate me quickly in that company because they could see my hunger. So, you know, success ultimately comes from, you know, really having the right attitude, in my opinion. Like anyone can learn a skill set, but if you don't have the right attitude and the right work ethic, it won't matter what your skill set is. The success only comes to the people who absolutely bleed out their eyes and fight to death for what they believe in and what they want out of life. That's it, man. It's really just comes down to that because you can have nothing. And like a lot of these stories you hear from people, they always had nothing and it forced them to learn to go after it and go get it, right? When you're given everything, you, have, you don't have that muscle. You, it, when, if you're not broke, you don't appreciate being rich at all. You're just like- yep this was what life was supposed to be. You know, my parents gave me everything and here I am. It's like, until you really are only eating ramens for every meal, not once a week, every meal, until you get there, you don't appreciate Mastro's or any of the nice fine dining restaurants you go to. And now when I walk into a nice restaurant, I appreciate everything because I know what it's like to be that server who's barely getting by and who's serving me. And I remember being that kid and uh, man, do I go overboard on those servers. I tip them so well. And my wife loves it because she's always like, oh, you made that guy's day tonight. And uh, nothing feels better because I was that guy. And I know what it's like to be hungry. And man, if I could just instill that in my kids somehow, some way, I know my kids would be all right. But, you know, it's hard because you want to give your kids everything and you want to be there for them. 
But, um, you know, just like my parents cut me off at a certain point, you know, it's the, it's gotta be the toughest thing in the world for your kid to be out somewhere and living by themselves, asking for help. And you just going, sorry, even though I have the money, sorry, go figure it out. You know how tough that must've been on my mom. She must've been sleepless nights every night, dude, losing her mind. Cause I was her only kid. It was probably the worst time of her life. I think she remembered she told me that. It was like the worst time. But man, did that little bit of pushback from them just change the trajectory in my life. So I know that was a really long-winded answer, but um, it's an no, important I mean, one. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that was, I mean, anybody listening right now, hopefully they were taking notes or, or put a little reminder to go back and listen to that part because that was super impactful. And it's just a common theme as I interview more and more amazing people like you. It's all about the mindset. It's all about being confident. And and 50% of it is just showing up. Like people forget that. There's 50% of the people won't even show up. So if you show up, you're already better than half the group. And do what you can to do the other 50% to the best of your ability. And you will be so surprised at how much better you are than people who you might think are better than you. So I love that. And being conscious of time, I've got one more question for you here. Let me um, say one more thing before you yeah. get to that question, because I think it's really important. It's something that I have noticed here internally on the people that overachieve here. I think one of the most important things that we see in people who crush it here at True Classic is this thing called curiosity. This mm -hmm. curiosity of, you know, what can I do to make this more efficient in my job and for the company? What else is out there? This is something Ben does a great job of. Like, what, what is, who can I talk to in my industry that is going through a similar thing that I can just reach out to and say, hey, what's working for you, Jeff, over at, you know, X startup? Like, what, what are you guys doing for fulfillment uh, inventory management? What are you guys doing for uh, CRM? Who are you guys using? Like, just being curious, man, does it send you to places um, that just end up being so fruitful for everyone. You know, it's just the curiosity factor, um, is so important because it just keeps you always looking for the next best thing. Like AI, how, how is, and people are so tired of us talking about AI here internally at True Classic because we can't shut up about it. But what we see is like, look, this is going to, this is not going to replace you. What this is going to do is enhance the way you do your job. And so, like, don't look at this as the end. This is not Terminators. This is like, oh, this program can just make my job that much more efficient, right? So that's, curiosity is a big one that I don't hear enough people talk about. But man, when we see it, it is such a golden trait of, of a human because we know that that job that they're serving is only going to get better and better and better and better over time, right? Like yep. It's not going to move laterally. That, that guy is going to find a way and they always do. They say, oh, this new piece of software, like, like Brianna, our head of customer service, she was using, uh, I think, Gorgeous, which is kind of the industry standard, right? We're like, go find an AI version of Gorgeous. Go figure it out. And she went and she did it and she found it and she's killing it now. And she increased the efficiency by like 70%. We were able That's to amazing. not have to hire so many more customer services as we scaled. And so curiosity, man, it's really important. Yeah. And... I think I'm I'm naturally a curious person and all of the successful people around me, all of the opportunities and business ideas and, and, and rooms that I've gotten myself into have been just because I'm curious. Like I, I'm the type of person where if I hear something, if I hear a conversation and I'm like, oh, that's interesting, I'll just butt in and, and I'll just get in and because and, I just want to keep learning. I constantly yeah. want to know about the new cool thing. I constant and like that's why I did this podcast. <laughs> I want to get in the brains of people like you because I'm curious. I want to learn what makes you tick, what made you successful, what were you able to kind of go through and navigate and, and create this opportunity for yourself and and I think it's just a great highlight. It's not said enough how curiosity yeah. is such a golden trait. Yeah. Here's one last one real quick uh, that Gary Vee always talks about, but no one really pays attention because Gary Vee says a lot of the same stuff over and over. And I think people are just kind of like, yeah, 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 we get it. Work hard. But like, there's something that Gary always says that really resonates with me. And I don't think enough people pay attention to it. So I keep surfacing it is the power of being nice to people and what that does for your life. 
And I look yep. at the people around me that aren't nice and they're struggling. They really are struggling because no one wants to work with them. No one wants to deal with them. No one wants to be around people that aren't nice. Niceness is such a hack to, to, to really just um, surround yourself with people that are nice so that, you know, eventually when you're nice to everybody, you would be shocked at how much the doors of life open up to you. Like when I, when I talk to periodically, I'll talk to a group of kids who are like either like in high school or like whatever, they're like young kids. And I'm telling them, I'm like, I know you guys don't care about being nice to anyone. Cause that's just the age you're at. I was like that too. When I was your age, but everyone that's around you in this room right now are potentially going to be the CEOs of, of Coca-Cola. So you better be nice to everybody because you don't know who's going to open what door for you, especially when yep. you go to college. Maybe that doesn't, it's not as necessary in high school, but in college, those people you're, you're around, they are opportunities for you to get in the door at your all time favorite company. Because if you didn't talk to Jeff, you're never going to get that opportunity. Right. But because you were nice to Jeff, that guy's the COO of your favorite company. And now, he knows you and he can vouch for you. And now you're in niceness, man. It, I try to teach this to my kids all the time. It's such a great just principle of life is just to be nice to everybody because you just never know how never that'll know. manifest later in life. And by the way, in business, it is a small community. People think like business is so massive and there's all these companies. No, no, no. The business world sure. is very, very tight knit and very small. And by the way, we all talk to each other. So when they come yeah. back and they go, hey, this person worked for you. Why don't they work for you anymore? Well, uh, Jerry, it's because they weren't nice to anybody. No one wanted to be around them. So yeah, they were a killer on paper. And that's why you're probably looking to hire them. But guess what? They're not so nice to people. And when you're not nice to people, you are out of here. And that is the first ticket. So niceness, man, it is, it is so underrated. And I just think people don't even know what that really means. Like, how do I just, you know, how am I just like, go, how do I go about my day and just be courteous and, um, you know, not have an attitude with people and just do what I'm supposed to do. And once in a while, do something like sweet for somebody, you know, like I do this thing where, um, I don't know if I have, oh, here, hold on. I got something for you. So you see this poker chip? Yeah. So poker chip has $50 on it and I'm not going to show the, the coupon code that's attached to it. But dude, I give these out. This is from my poker playing days. I made these true classic credit store credit on here, right? This one's 50 bucks. I have hundred dollar ones that I give out. I don't really give out the fifties. I give out the hundreds because they're so much more impactful and people love it. I gave one yesterday and I do this all the time to Uber Eats drivers. I made these and I give them out to these Uber Eats drivers who never get how many Uber drivers do you know they get gifts? Like zero mm, yeah, percent, <laughs> right? Like no one cares about Uber yeah. Eats drivers. They tip them, they're fine, bye. Uh, so I give him, I give uh, everyone that comes here, I give him a hundred bucks. And dude, this guy yesterday that I gave, he came to my house and I gave him one. He almost started tearing up. And he told me, this was the nicest thing anyone's ever done for him. He told me, uh, wow. you made my week. And I cannot That's believe amazing. you gave this to me. And what did this cost me? Nothing. It cost me yeah. nothing, right? So like just being nice to people, dude, it goes such a long way and doesn't even have to do with business. It's just like in life, you just got to do right by people. That's why I'm doing the teacher initiative. That's why we're, you know, sending a big supply thing to Maui. Um, you got to show up for people, man. You got to be good to people and people notice, right? Like I'm not doing this to be noticed. I'm just doing it because it's the right thing to do. And um, I just wish more people kind of lived and died by that attitude. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's crazy to think that we're talking about how being nice is a underappreciated trait. And I think we've just gotten lost in this crazy world that we live in. But I mean, I'm young, I'm early in career, and I've got an amazing job in a, a huge, amazing company. And all of my opportunities have come because I'm just a genuine person. And I have a conversation with somebody, they like me, and I don't ask for anything in return. I'm simply there to to meet somebody, network and, and talk. And then they'll be like, hey, you should talk to this person. I think you're great. And then it's boom, boom. And then next thing you know, like you said, doors start to just fly open. Um, so I, I love that highlight. And I, I think this is just a perfect segue into my last question to you about True Classics before we ask that famous final question and wrap up. And 
you're big into philanthropy. We just talked a little bit about it. True Classics loves to give back, especially to veterans. Where does that come from? And how has that affected the brand overall? And how much do you enjoy being able to just give back like that? Because I know you have the teacher initiative. You just said you're giving back to Maui. Like these are stand up amazing things that you're doing as a CEO. And I'm so proud to be talking to you because I love that you're doing that. Yeah. I mean, it comes from originally it was the uh, homeless veterans that my stepfather was working with down in Savannah. So he, um, like with most of my family, we're all veterans. So when he retired, he wanted to do more for them. So he was involved in a tiny home project down there. Um, you know, we helped facilitate a lot of the builds down there when they, I think they were, the first project was like 36 homes and, um, they just keep going, which has been great. So it started with that. Eventually, you know, I started looking around LA and I'm like, wow, there's 60,000 homeless people here in LA. This is insane. And so we just, you know, now we have it set up to where, um, we've worked with, uh, I just looked the other day, it was like 25 plus local charities here in LA, which is insane. It's, amazing. it's a lot. It's amazing. Um, and so what they do now is since they know we're so giving, they just show up to our warehouse. Well, that's not true. They'll coordinate with CC, our, our EA, but they'll basically know that on any given week, they can just come down, grab a pallet and start distributing them all over LA County. Um, so whether it's Skid Row or even on Sunset or wherever they're stationed at to give away, um, we just continually work with our local partners every single uh, month because they're all right here. They can just stop by and pick up whatever they need. And um, it's been great. I mean, it's been super fulfilling for me. Um, now, does it do anything for the business? Not really in terms of like PR and all that. I mean, we're just such a big business now that like I wouldn't expect it to either. I mean, just to give you an idea, you know, uh, I mean, the site gets like 140,000 people a day. So it's like any That's amount amazing. of like PR we would get from charity would never amount to like yeah. anything. But like, I'm, I don't do it for that. Like, I'm, I'm so okay with nobody knowing anything. By the way, this teacher initiative, I've been getting a lot of uh, press about it. But, you know, the other 150 initiatives that we've done over the last three or four years got nothing. Like literally, yeah. because we don't promote it. We don't put it out there. And by the way, I don't love to promote it because I, it feels gross when you promote, like, look what I'm doing for charity. You know, it's like, I just hate that. So like, I, that's why, you know, we have a PR team, but I always tell them, I don't want to talk about that kind of stuff because that feels slimy to me. I hate when like companies are trying to push that news onto the public. Like if the public finds out, great. I, I'm happy they found out and, and whatever. Like, but like, I hate, pushing it. So that's why no one knows about all the other stuff we've done. But um, I mean, we've donated to foster care. We've donated to people that have burned their house down. Um, any kind of natural disaster in the US, we're always there to donate. Um, even churches and schools that are underserved, we're there for them locally and, and nationwide. Um, a lot of charity events, we just donate stuff to and, and no one ever knows or sees that. You know, It's just kind of part of who we are and the values I've instilled in this company. So, you know, the teacher thing has been crazy lately because I actually have been going on uh, live news. Uh, I went on KTLA um, last week. I'm going to be on Fox News next week talking about this, which is fun. It, it's great for the teachers, too, because I get to uh, drive people to Twitter and get them to pay off these wish lists, which is an awesome thing to do. And just by me talking, it's so cool. I literally just I, I create I make it very actionable. I'm not there to talk about true classic at all. So even if they're like, hey, tell us about your class, I'm like, no, I'm not here for that. What I'm here to talk about is go to Twitter and type in uh, clear the list and start paying these mofos off because they need your dollars. And so um, I love just doing things for the right reason. Um, and that's really, you know, it comes from the right place when you, when you do it genuinely like that. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, it. It, it just speaks volumes about you, your brand and everything you've created at the core. I mean, you're just such a good person. And I think we need more people like you in the world. Appreciate and, that. and, and I mean, you're, you're just crushing it. We're, we're at that point here where I ask that question I ask at the end of every episode and it's very simple and you can answer it however you want. And it's Ryan, what are you excited about in the near future? In the near future, um, I think one of the things I'm the most excited about is probably our upcoming women's line. Um, so we're, you know, we're trying to solve problems for women the same way we solve problems for men. 
And so we're really trying to solve the fit problem, which is just being more intentional about how things are built for women's bodies. And so, you know, we're taking what we learned from men, we're applying it to women. It is a completely different ball game, as you would expect. It's a lot more complicated, but um, man, if we can really nail this, I think it's going to be really special. And I also think it's going to catapult us into a whole nother stratosphere for the business. So I'm really taking my time and energy to get it right. Um, in the near future, that's like the most exciting thing, in my opinion, that's happening with this company. Um, we have a lot of other big initiatives, but like to take care of women that um, have also been underserved on the fit department, in my opinion, uh, just feels pretty special. And they are a huge piece of the buying market. So I hope it goes well and they love it. Um, I'm definitely not here to just kind of check the box of making women's clothing. Uh, I want to do it right or not do it at all. So we'll see how it goes. That's awesome. Man. And I'm super excited now to follow you guys because I agree that could be, I mean, that could double the revenue of True Classic, which would be insane. Mm -hmm. So I'm super excited to follow you on that journey and continue to watch as you launch that product. And I know it's going to be successful. Um, Ryan, this has been such a great conversation. Where can people connect with you, chat with you and follow this journey? Um, Twitter, it's just my name. Uh, LinkedIn, same thing. I think that's the easiest place to find me. Okay, perfect. And all that stuff will be linked in the bio below for people who want to go and, and, and check it out. But I mean, Ryan, I, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to come on the show. This has been such a great conversation. And I, I'm really looking forward to watching you continue to crush it. Likewise, man. Thank you. I appreciate you. And, and listen, if I was anywhere uh, where you are at your age at 20, I mean, dude, you are killing it. I was a <laughs> complete lost soul at your age. So I think you're doing amazing things. And uh, I'm really encouraged to watch you on your journey as well. Thank you so much, man. Thanks for coming on. Absolutely.